I appreciate David singing that last psalm because that kind of sums up why we worship the way we worship. Because everything we do, whether it's in our singing, uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper, whatever, uh, we want to do it all in the name of the Lord. Do it according in, you know, to the way that He desires us to as found in God's Word. So we want to spend our time looking in God's Word to find out what His will for us is. Uh, recently, there was a, a question asked, <clears throat> what's the greatest threat to evangelizing the world? I think all of us want to be involved in evangelizing the world, regardless of where the world is, whether it's next door to, to us or halfway around the world. Well, there was a, a, a recent religious conference, and one of the answers put forth, which was, I thought, kind of surprising, and that's what I want to talk about today, was idolatry. Idolatry. And here's how it was defined. An attack on God's exclusive rights to our love, our trust, and our obedience. That's how it was defined as idolatry. Anything that attacks God's exclusive rights to our love, our trust, and our obedience. That was idolatry. So when looked at from that angle, I can see why that would be a major reason to keep people from accepting God. Something that was attacking God's exclusive rights. One went on to say this, all humans have been created to be reflected beings and they will reflect whatever they're ultimately committed to, whether the true God or some other object. We reflect things. We reflect whether it's going to be God or it's going to be something in the world. Now that's not a new concept. The psalmist wrote about this way back in Psalms. Please get your Bibles. We're going to spend a lot of time in God's Word today. And we're going to begin by looking at Psalm 115 before we go to 1 Thessalonians. Psalm 115. <clears throat> and we'll begin in verse 1. Psalm 115. And we'll read the first eight verses to show how God's Word approaches the idea of idolatry. Verse 1 of Psalms 115 says... Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory, because of your mercy, because of your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. There's the idea of us being people, beings that reflect. So whatever our idol is, that's what we're going to be like. Whether it's God, in other words, are we going to bow down and worship God and be like Him? Are we going to allow something in the world to be what we reflect? Because we're going to reflect something. And what is it that we're going to reflect? Well, what does this have to do with our series from 1 Thessalonians? Well, notice in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 9, what those Thessalonian Christians had done. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. <clears throat> says, For they themselves declared concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. And notice the second part of that verse. And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Many of those Christians in Thessalonica had at one time been idolaters. They had worshipped some type of idol. That is nothing new. People have been worshipping idols almost from the very beginning of time. 
We go all the way back to the days of Abraham. People were worshiping idols in the days of Abraham. Notice with me Joshua chapter 24. Just to show how old idolatry is. Joshua chapter 24, and we're going to read verse 2. Joshua chapter 24, and we're going to read verse 2. Give everybody time to get there, and notice what is said about the time of Abraham. Joshua 24, verse 2. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Naor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Idolatry is very old. It's been around for many, many years. Men have always found something to worship. They weren't worshiping God, they were worshiping some idol. And so when we get to the time when the law of Moses comes into effect, notice in Exodus chapter 20 what one of the commandments happens to be about. Exodus chapter 20, let's begin reading in verse 1. Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> this is speaking. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that's in heaven above, or that's in the earth beneath, or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Now, notice, and this is kind of subtle, but I think it's a good point. Notice in those verses, he says, those people who worship other gods, what do they do? They hate Jehovah. So no wonder idolatry is such a stumbling block to world evangelism. Because when somebody worships something other than God, they hate God. And so no wonder idolatry has been denounced by God from the very beginning because of what it does to people. Since we're going to reflect something, if we don't reflect God, we're going to be reflecting something of the world something that becomes sinful to us because we're not reflecting God. We're not reflecting the image of God. We go to the Old Testament. I won't take time to, to read it, but both the northern kingdom, those ten tribes, why were they taken into Assyrian captivity? We go back and read the book of Second Kings, and what does it tell us? Idolatry. That's why God sent them into captivity. They never came out of it, basically. The two southern tribes, the southern kingdom, why were they taken into Babylonian captivity? Same reason, idolatry. So it was an immense problem even for God's people during those days. Idolatry. They worshipped all kinds of things other than Jehovah God. But it wasn't just an Old Testament problem. There's many New Testament warnings about it. Remember what happens when Paul's on one of his missionary journeys and he ends up in Athens? In Acts chapter 17, we read about Paul's experience in that great city of the first century. Acts chapter 17, <clears throat> beginning in verse 22. This was a very idolatrous city. This is the first century. 2,000 years ago or less. Verse 22 of Acts 17. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. And they were. They worshipped all kinds of things. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. 
God who made the world and everything in it, since he's Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to, uh, to all life, breath, and all things. And he's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we're also his offspring. Therefore, since we're the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and men's devising. God, the one who made the world and everything in it, the one who made man and gave us an eternal spirit, does not dwell in objects made by man's hands. He doesn't dwell in anything in the world in that sense that's made by man, devised by man. He is spirit. He's not some physical object, nor does he dwell in a physical object. And Paul, when he's there, makes that very clear. The people in Corinth also lived amongst people who were idolaters. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we see how this was a problem in the city of Corinth, another very idolatrous city. And if you notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7, Paul writes to them. And remember, he's writing to Christians in Corinth and he tells them in verse 7, and do not become idolaters as, as were some of them. As it's written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Verse 14 of that same chapter, he tells them, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Run as fast as you can from it. Don't even hang around idolatry. And then when he wrote the second letter to the church at Corinth, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he writes this. Beginning in verse 15, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 15. And again, remember, these people lived amongst idolatry. Everywhere was idolatry. Beginning in verse 15. And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what's unclean, and I will receive you. They had to constantly be warned about anything unclean. Idols. And more about that in a moment. Peter even had this to say about idolatry. Paul wasn't the only one. In 1 Peter chapter 4... Peter notes this beginning in verse 3. <clears throat> so 1 Peter chapter 4 beginning in verse 3, the apostle Peter also warned the people about the evil and idolatry. Peter writes in verse 3 of 1 Peter 4, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. How do the people of the world live? They lived with abominable idolatries. Idolatries have always been with men. So what are some of the ways we could define an idol? Whatever we revere and worship, what we conform ourselves to. Here's some things that the Bible talks about that have become our idol. Here's some things that, that we know from our society can become an idol. Greed can become our idol. Coveting can become our idol. In other words, wanting something so much that that's what we're 
focusing our life on, then that thing has become our idol. No, we didn't physically make some object, but it's the same thing because that's what's taking up our time and efforts and energy and that's what we're thinking about, then that's what we're reflecting because that's what our life is about. This is what I want, so that's become my idol. So being greedy, coveting power. We've seen this become an idol for many people in the world through the ages. Power. That's their idol. They want power more than anything and they'll do anything to get that power. So it's become their idol. That's what they worship. They want power. Some, it's success and popularity. In other words, they want it so bad, they will do anything to get it. So their lives are reflecting that popularity. That's what they want. Some people, their lives consist of one thing, and that's recreation. That, that's it. That's, that's, you know, the only reason they work is so they can have recreation. That's what they think about during the week is they can have recreation on the weekend. And if they couldn't have that recreation on the weekend, they wouldn't work. So recreation has become their idol because that's everything to them. What they think about, what they focus their thoughts on. That's what they use their money for, their time for, their efforts for. That's their idol. That's their God now. Any type of entertainment can, can be in that same category. If that's what your life is about, some type of entertainment, then that entertainment has, in essence, become your idol. You're worshiping it. You're revering it. Because that's what you want more than anything. And notice, these things aren't necessarily bad, but when that's what you want more than anything, that's when they become sinful. That's when they become an idol. And when you start chasing idols, you become an idolater, just like those in the Bible. Of course, for some, sexual immorality is their idol. I mean, that's, that's what they focus all their time on, is sexual immorality of whatever kind. That's what they want more than anything. That's what they think about. That's what they spend their time on, their efforts. Then that's become their God. So anything that excites us like that, that takes up our time, that enslaves us, that's become our God. In Galatians chapter 4, <clears throat> Paul says this, beginning in verse 8. Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. <clears throat> He's concerned about some of the people there and, and what might happen to them. He says, beginning in verse 8 of Galatians chapter 4, and you can just see him writing how concerned he is for these Christians. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? He says, once you've known God, why would you ever look to anything else. That's what he asks. Regardless what the anything else is. Why would you ever look for anything else? You found the one and true God. You found Jehovah, the creator of the world. Why look for anything else? Why go back to any type of idols? Well, the Bible gives us hope, though. That's the message of the Bible in some ways. Hope. It tells us there are ways for us to remove idolatry. It gives us insight into how to remove it. The first thing we need to do is use good judgment. God has given us a mind. The Bible tells us to use our mind. In Isaiah chapter 44, Isaiah gives us some great advice about idols regardless of what kind they are. <clears throat> we see how foolish idolatry is regardless of what our idol has become and how we need to respond. How do we get rid of idolatry? Notice beginning in verse 9 of Isaiah 44. Those who make an image, all of them are useless. And their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. 
They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a god or mold an image that profits from nothing? Surely all his companions would be ashamed, and the workmen, their mere men. Let them all be gathered together, let them stand up, yet they shall fear, they shall be ashamed together. Notice how he says this is, this is shameful. Why would you even consider doing this? He says, The blacksmith with the tongs works one in the coals, fashions it with hammers, and works it with the strength of his arms. Even so, he's hungry and his strength fails, he drinks no water and is faint. The craftsman stretches out his rule. He marks one out with chalk. He fashions it with a plane. He marks it out with a compass and makes it like the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. He cuts down cedars for himself and takes the cypress and the oak. He secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warms himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes a carved image and falls down to it. Notice how ridiculous Isaiah is, is picturing this. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half he eats meat. He, he roasts the roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I'm warm, I've seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god. His carved image. He falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, Deliver me for you're my god. They do not know nor understand, for he shut their eyes so they cannot see, and their hearts so they cannot understand. And no one considers it in his heart, nor is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I've burned half of it in the fire. Yes, I've also baked bread on its coals. I've roasted meat and eaten it, and shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? God says, Use your mind to see how ridiculous this is. Use good judgment. Discern. You know, God has given us a mind, and he expects us, demands us, to use it. So he paints this picture of idolatry. He says, Look at this guy. He takes a tree that he's nurtured over time, that he's caused to grow. He cuts it down. He uses some of it uh, to make a fire and bakes bread. And out of that same tree, he carves an image and falls down before it and worships it. He says, how insane is that? That's what Isaiah is saying. How insane is that? And you expect that carved piece of wood that you cut down to somehow do something for you and be a god? Isaiah says, that's ridiculous. So use good judgment. So when we think about the things in our lives, it says use good judgment to make sure you are not falling down before something that has no power. Entertainment can't save us. Sexual immorality can't save us. Power can't save us. None of those things can save us. Use the power of the gospel. This is a, a, a quote from a writer about this same topic. False gods destroy and devour lives, health, and resources. They distort and diminish our humanity. They preside over injustice, greed, perversion, cruelty, lust, and violence. It is possibly the most satanic dimension of their deceptive power that in spite of all this, they still persuade people that they are the beneficent protectors of their worshippers' identity, dignity, and prosperity, and must therefore be defended at all cost. Only the gospel can unmask these claims. Look at all that these things we've talked about, like power and popularity and entertainment and recreation, and sexual immorality, look at all those things and look at the result of them. Look what they have brought about. Look at all the evil in the world that's come about from people passionately pursuing power. Look at all the wars that's been fought and the people that's lost their lives because one person or a group of people wanted power. Or look at all that, uh, that entertainment or recreation has brought down to people. 
that's brought them down because they have pursued that more than anything else. And yet people do what in the quote? They still defend it. They still defend it. People have doing, been doing that since the beginning of time and I assume will. We should be like the Thessalonians. We should make an active decision to turn from idols to the living God. Since we're going to reflect something, let's don't reflect those things of the world, those things of Satan. Let's reflect the things of God. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and then this lesson is going to be yours. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This is a marvelous verse about just the opposite of being an idolater. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the last verse of that chapter says, verse 18. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, there's the idea of reflecting, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. What do we see in the mirror? That's what he says. What do we see in the mirror? If I see power in the mirror, that's what I'm going to become more and more like. If I see popularity in the mirror, that's what I'm going to become more and more like. That's what's going to mean more to me than anything else. Entertainment or recreation or uh, physical pleasure, sexual immorality, that, if that's what I see in the mirror, I'm going to become more and more like that. Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 3, we need to see what? We need to see Christ in the mirror and become more and more like Him. Reflect Him. Reflect that image, not the things of the world. Yes, idolatry goes back many, many years, but it is still alive and well in the world and always will be. But we're to be different. People are to see us as people who reflect the image of Christ, not the things of the world. And that should always be what we look at and, and want to be like and revere and worship is Christ, not the things of the world. Can we safely say we're not idolaters? The Bible says you can come out of idolatry. The Thessalonians turned from idolatry. Many in Corinth turned from idolatry. People can turn from being idolaters. But it takes that, that great word, difficult word, repentance. But that's what the Thessalonians did. They turned from idols to God. And we can too. This morning you may need to do that very thing. You may need to ask for forgiveness because you've been allowing things of the world to override things of God. Or you may need to, you need to make that great decision to become a Christian, a child of God in the first place. But if you need to respond to, to any of those, we encourage you to come and do that as we stand and sing.